Part one. Persons of the dialogue. Socrates, read by Rosalind Wills. Timaeus, read by Anna Simon. Critias, read by Michael Evans, Champaign, Illinois. Hermocrates, read by Leon Meyer. One, two, three. But where, my dear Timaeus, is the fourth of those who were yesterday my guests and are to be my entertainers today? He has been taken ill, Socrates, for he would not willingly have been absent from this gathering. Then, if he is not coming, you and the two others must supply his place. Certainly, and we will do all that we can. Having been handsomely entertained by you yesterday, those of us who remain should be only too glad to return your hospitality. Do you remember what were the points of which I required you to speak? We remember some of them, and you will be here to remind us of anything which we have forgotten. Or rather, if we are not troubling you, will you briefly recapitulate the whole, and then the particulars will be more firmly fixed in our memories? To be sure I will. The chief theme of my yesterday's discourse was the state, how constituted and of what citizens composed it would seem likely to be the most perfect. Yes, Socrates and what you said of it was very much to our mind. Did we not begin by separating the husbandmen and the artisans from the class of defenders of the state? Yes. And when we had given to each one that single employment and particular art which was suited to his nature, we spoke of those who were intended to be our warriors, and said that they were to be guardians of the city against attacks from within as well as from without, and to have no other employment. They were to be merciful in judging their subjects, of whom they were by nature friends, but fierce to their enemies when they came across them in battle. Exactly. We said, if I am not mistaken, that the guardian should be gifted with a temperament in a high degree both passionate and philosophical, and that then they would be as they ought to be, gentle to their friends and fierce with their enemies. Certainly. And what did we say of their education? Were they not to be trained in gymnastic and music and all other sorts of knowledge which were proper for them? Very true. And being thus trained, they were not to consider gold or silver or anything else to be their own private property. They were to be like hired troops, receiving pay for keeping guard from those who were protected by them. The pay was to be no more than would suffice for men of simple life, and they were to spend in common, and to live together in the continual practice of virtue which was to be their sole pursuit. That was also said. Neither did we forget the women, of whom we declared that their natures should be assimilated and brought into harmony with those of the men and that common pursuits should be assigned to them both in time of war and in their ordinary life. That, again, was as you say. And what about the procreation of children? Or rather, was not the proposal too singular to be forgotten? For all wives and children were to be in common, to the intent that no one should ever know his own child, but they were to imagine that they were all one family. Those who were within a suitable limit of age were to be brothers and sisters, those who were of an elder generation, parents and grandparents, and those of a younger, children and grandchildren. Yes, and the proposal is easy to remember, as you say. And do you also remember how, with a view of securing as far as we could the best breed, we said that the chief magistrates, male and female, should contrive secretly, by the use of certain lots, so to arrange the nuptial meeting that the bad of either sex and the good of either sex might pair with their like, and there was to be no quarrelling on this account, for they would imagine that the union was a mere accident, and was to be attributed to the lot. I remember. And you remember how we said that the children of the good parents were to be educated, and the children of the bad secretly dispersed among the inferior citizens, and while they were all growing up, the rulers were to be on the lookout, and to bring up from below in their turn those who were worthy, and those among themselves who were unworthy were to take the places of those who came up. True. Then have I now given you all the heads of our yesterday's discussion? Or is there anything more, my dear Timaeus, which has been omitted? Nothing, Socrates. It was just as you have said. I should like, before proceeding further, to tell you how I feel about the state which we have described. I might compare myself to a person who, on beholding beautiful animals either created by the painter's art, or better still, alive but at rest, is seized with a desire of seeing them in motion or engaged in some struggle or conflict to which their forms appear suited. This is my feeling about the state which we have been describing. There are conflicts which all cities undergo, and I should like to hear someone tell of our own city carrying on a struggle against her neighbors, and how she went out to war in a becoming manner, and when at war showed by the greatness of her actions and the magnanimity of her words in dealing with other cities as a result worthy of her training and education. 
Now I, Critias and Hermocrates, am conscious that I myself should never be able to celebrate the city and her citizens in a befitting manner, and I am not surprised at my own incapacity. To me the wonder is rather that the poets, present as well as past, are no better. Not that I mean to depreciate them, but every one can see that they are a tribe of imitators, and will imitate best and most easily the life in which they have been brought up, while that which is beyond the range of a man's education he finds hard to carry out in action, and still harder adequately to represent in language. I am aware that the sophists have plenty of brave words and fair conceits, but I am afraid that being only wanderers from one city to another, and having never had habitations of their own, they may fail in their conception of philosophers and statesmen, and may not know what they do and say in time of war, when they are fighting or holding parley with their enemies. And thus people of your class are the only ones remaining who are fitted by nature and education to take part at once both in politics and philosophy. Here is Timius, of Locris in Italy, a city which has admirable laws, and who is himself in wealth and rank the equal of any of his fellow citizens. He has held the most important and honorable offices in his own state, and, as I believe, has scaled the heights of all philosophy. And here is Critias, whom every Athenian knows to be no novice in the matter of which we are speaking, and as to Hermocrates, I am assured by many witnesses that his genius and education qualify him to take part in any speculation of the kind. And therefore, yesterday, when I saw that you wanted me to describe the formation of the state, I readily assented, being very well aware that, if you only would, none were better qualified to carry the discussion further, and that, when you had engaged our city in a suitable war, you of all men living could best exhibit her playing a fitting part. When I had completed my task, I in return imposed this other task upon you. You conferred together and agreed to entertain me today, as I had entertained you, with a feast of discourse. Here am I in festive array, and no man can be more ready for the promised banquet. And we too, Socrates, as Timaeus says, will not be wanting in enthusiasm, and there is no excuse for not complying with your request. As soon as we arrived yesterday at the guest chamber of Critias, with whom we are staying, or rather on our way thither, we talked the matter over, and he told us an ancient tradition, which I wish, Critias, that you would repeat to Socrates, so that he may help us to judge whether it will satisfy his requirements or not. I will, if Timaeus, who is our other partner, approves. I quite approve. Then listen, Socrates, to a tale which, though strange, is certainly true, having been attested by Solon, who was the wisest of the seven sages. He was a relative and a dear friend of my great-grandfather, Dropides, as he himself says in many passages of his poems, and he told the story to Critias, my grandfather, who remembered and repeated it to us. There were of old, he said, great and marvelous actions of the Athenian city, which have passed into oblivion through lapse of time and the destruction of mankind, and one in particular greater than all the rest. This we will now rehearse. It will be a fitting monument of our gratitude to you, and a hymn of praise true and worthy of the goddess on this her day of festival. Very good. And what is this ancient famous action of the Athenians, which Critias declared on the authority of Solon, to be not a mere legend but an actual fact? I will tell an old-world story which I heard from an aged man, for Critias, at the time of telling it, was, as he said, nearly ninety years of age, and I was about ten. Now the day was that day of the Apaturia, which is called the Registration of Youth, at which, according to custom, our parents gave prizes for recitations, and the poems of several poets were recited by us boys, and many of us sang the poems of Solon, which at that time had not gone out of fashion. One of our tribe, either because he thought so or to please Critias, said that in his judgment Solon was not only the wisest of men, but also the noblest of poets. The old man, as I very well remember, brightened up at hearing this and said, smiling, Yes, Aminander, if Solon had only, like other poets, made poetry the business of his life, and had completed the tale which he brought with him from Egypt, and had not been compelled, by reason of the factions and troubles which he found stirring in his own country when he came home, to attend to other matters. In my opinion, he would have been as famous as Homer or Hesiod, or any poet. And what was the tale about, Critias? said Aminander. About the greatest action which the Athenians ever did, and which ought to have been the most famous, but, through the lapse of time and the destruction of the actors, it has not come down to us. Tell us, said the other, the whole story, and how and from whom Solon heard this veritable tradition. He replied, In the Egyptian delta, at the head of which the Nile River divides, 
there is a certain district which is called the district of Sais, and the great city of the district is also called Sais, and is the city from which King Amasis came. The citizens have a deity for their foundress. She is called, in the Egyptian tongue, Nath, and is asserted by them to be the same whom the Hellenes call Athene. They are great lovers of the Athenians, and say that they are in some way related to them. To this city came Solon, and was received there with great honor. He asked the priests who were most skillful in such matters about antiquity, and made the discovery that neither he nor any other Hellene knew anything worth mentioning about the times of old. On one occasion, wishing to draw them on to speak of antiquity, he began to tell about the most ancient things in our part of the world, about Pheronius, who is called the first man, and about Niobe, and after the deluge of the survival of Deucalion and Pyrrha, and he traced the genealogy of their descendants, and reckoning up the dates, tried to compute how many years ago the events of which he was speaking happened. Thereupon, one of the priests, who was of a very great age, said, O Solon, Solon, you Hellenes are never anything but children, and there is not an old man among you. Solon in return asked him what he meant. I meant to say, he replied, that in mind you are all young. There is no old opinion handed down among you by ancient tradition, nor any science which is hoary with age. And I will tell you why. There have been, and will be again, many destructions of mankind, arising out of many causes, the greatest have been brought about by the agencies of fire and water, and other lesser ones by innumerable other causes. There is a story, which even you have preserved, that once upon a time Pathon, the son of Helios, having yoked the steeds in his father's chariot, because he was not able to drive them in the path of his father, burnt up all that was upon the earth, and was himself destroyed by a thunderbolt. Now this has the form of a myth, but really signifies a declination of the bodies moving in the heavens around the earth, and a great conflagration of things upon the earth, which recurs after long intervals. At such times, those who live upon the mountains and in dry and lofty places are more liable to destruction than those who dwell by rivers or on the seashore. And from this calamity, the Nile, who is our never-failing savior, delivers and preserves us. When, on the other hand, the gods purge the earth with a deluge of water, the survivors in your country are herdsmen and shepherds who dwell on the mountains, but those who, like you, live in cities are carried by the rivers into the sea. Whereas in this land, neither then nor at any other time does the water come down from above on the fields, having always a tendency to come up from below, for which reason the traditions preserved here are the most ancient. The fact is that wherever the extremity of winter frost or of summer sun does not prevent Mankind exist, sometimes in greater, sometimes in lesser numbers. And whatever happened, either in your country or in ours, or in any other region of which we are informed, if there were any actions, noble or great, or in any other way remarkable, they have all been written down by us of old, and are preserved in our temples. Whereas just when you and other nations are beginning to be provided with letters and the other requisites of civilized life, after the usual interval, the stream from heaven, like a pestilence, comes pouring down, and leaves only those of you who are destitute of letters and education, and so you have to begin all over again like children, and know nothing of what happened in ancient times, either among us or among yourselves. As for those genealogies of yours, of which you just now recounted to us, Solon, they are no better than the tales of children. In the first place, you remember a single deluge only but there were many previous ones. In the next place, you do not know that there formerly dwelt in your land the fairest and noblest race of men which ever lived, and that you and your whole city are descended from a small seed or remnant of them which survived. And this was unknown to you because, for many generations, the survivors of that destruction died, leaving no written word. For there was a time, Solon, before the great deluge of all, when the city which is now Athens was first in war, and in every way the best governed of all cities, is said to have performed the noblest deeds, and to have had the fairest constitution of any of which tradition tells under the face of heaven. Solon marveled at his words, and earnestly requested the priest to inform him exactly and in order about these former citizens. You are welcome to hear about them, Solon, said the priest, for both your own sake and for that of your city, and above all, for the sake of the goddess, who is the common patron and parent and educator of both our cities. She founded your city a thousand years before ours. 
observed that Plato gives the same date, 9,000 years ago, for the foundation of Athens and for the repulse of the invasion from Atlantis. Receiving from the earth and Hephaestus the seed of your race, and afterwards she founded ours, of which the constitution is recorded in our sacred registers to be 8,000 years old. As touching your citizens of 9,000 years ago, I will briefly inform you of their laws and of their most famous action. The exact particulars of the whole we will hereafter go through at our leisure in the sacred registers themselves. If you compare these very laws with ours, you will find that many of ours are the counterpart of yours, as they were in the olden time. In the first place, there is the caste of priests, which is separated from all the others. Next, there are the artificers, who ply their several crafts by themselves and do not intermix. And also there is the class of shepherds and of hunters, as well as that of husbandmen. And you will observe, too, that the warriors in Egypt are distinct from all the other classes, and are commanded by the law to devote themselves solely to military pursuits. Moreover, the weapons which they carry are shields and spears, a style of equipment which the goddess taught of Asiatics first to us, as in your part of the world first to you. Then as to wisdom, do you observe how our law from the very first made a study of the whole order of things, extending even to prophecy and medicine which gives health, out of these divine elements deriving what was needed for human life, and adding every sort of knowledge which was akin to them. All this order and arrangement the goddess first imparted to you when establishing your city, and she chose the spot of earth in which you were born, because she saw that the happy temperament of the seasons in that land would produce the wisest of men. Wherefore the goddess, who was a lover both of war and of wisdom, selected and first of all settled that spot which was the most likely to produce men likest herself. And there you dwelt, having such laws as these and still better ones, and excelled all mankind in all virtue, as became the children and disciples of the gods. Many great and wonderful deeds are recorded of your state in our histories, but one of them exceeds all the rest in greatness and valor. For these histories tell of a mighty power which, unprovoked, made an expedition against the whole of Europe and Asia, and to which your city put an end. This power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean, for in those days the Atlantic was navigable, and there was an island situated in front of the straits which are by you called the Pillars of Heracles. The island was larger than Libya and Asia put together, and was the way to the other islands, and from these you might pass to the whole of the opposite continent which surrounded the true ocean. For this sea, which is within the Straits of Heracles, is only a harbor, having a narrow entrance, but that other is a real sea, and the surrounding land may be most truly called a boundless continent. Now in this island of Atlantis there was a great and wonderful empire which had ruled over the whole island and several others, and over parts of the continent, and furthermore, the men of Atlantis had subjected the parts of Libya within the columns of Heracles as far as Egypt, and of Europe as far as Tyrrhenia. This vast power, gathered into one, endeavored to subdue at a blow our country and yours, and the whole of the region within the straits, and then Solon your country shone forth in the excellence of her virtue and strength among all mankind, she was preeminent in courage and military skill, and was the leader of the Hellenes. And when the rest fell off from her, being compelled to stand alone, after having undergone the very extremity of danger, she defeated and triumphed over the invaders, and preserved from slavery those who were not yet subjugated, and generously liberated all the rest of us who dwell within the pillars. But afterwards there occurred violent earthquakes and floods, and in a single day and night of misfortune, all your warlike men in a body sank into the earth, and the island of Atlantis, in like manner, disappeared in the depths of the sea. For which reason the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable, because there is a shoal of mud in the way, and this was caused by the subsidence of the island. I have told you briefly, Socrates, what the aged Critias heard from Solon and related to us. And when you were speaking yesterday about your city and citizens, the tale which I have just been repeating to you came into my mind, and I remarked with astonishment how, by some mysterious coincidence, you agreed in almost every particular with the narrative of Solon. But I did not like to speak at the moment, for a long time had elapsed, and I had forgotten too much. I thought that I might first of all run over the narrative in my own mind, and then I would speak. And so I readily assented to your request yesterday, considering that in all such cases the chief difficulty is to find a tale suitable to our purpose and that with such a tale we should be fairly well provided. And therefore, as Hermocrates has told you, on my way home yesterday I at once communicated the tale to my companions as I remembered it, 
and after I left them during the night, by thinking, I recovered nearly the whole of it. Truly, as is often said, the lessons of our childhood make a wonderful impression on our memories, for I am not sure that I could remember all the discourse of yesterday, but I should be much surprised if I forgot any of these things which I have heard very long ago. I listened at the time with childlike interest to the old man's narrative. He was very ready to teach me, and I asked him again and again to repeat his words, so that like an indelible picture they were branded into my mind. As soon as the day broke, I rehearsed them as he spoke them to my companions, that they, as well as myself, might have something to say. And now, Socrates, to make an end of my preface, I am ready to tell you the whole tale. I will give you not only the general heads, but the particulars as they were told to me. The city and citizens, which you yesterday described to us in fiction, we will now transfer to the world of reality. It shall be the ancient city of Athens, and we will suppose that the citizens whom you imagined were our veritable ancestors, of whom the priest spoke. They will perfectly harmonize, and there will be no inconsistency in saying that the citizens of your republic are these ancient Athenians. Let us divide the subject among us, and all endeavor, according to our ability, gracefully to execute the task which you have imposed upon us. Consider then, Socrates, if this narrative is suited to the purpose, or whether we should seek for some other instead. And what other, Critias, can we find that will be better than this, which is natural and suitable to the festival of the goddess, and has the very great advantage of being a fact and not a fiction? How or where shall we find another if we abandon this? We cannot, and therefore you must tell the tale, and good luck to you, and I, in return for my yesterday's discourse, will now rest and be a listener. Let me proceed to explain to you, Socrates, the order in which we have arranged our entertainment. Our intention is that Timaeus, who is the most of an astronomer among us, and has made the nature of the universe his special study, should speak first, beginning with the generation of the world, and going down to the creation of man. Next, I am to receive the men whom he has created, and of whom some will have profited by the excellent education which you have given them. And then, in accordance with the tale of Solon, and equally with his law, we will bring them into court and make them citizens, as if they were those very Athenians whom the sacred Egyptian record has recovered from oblivion and thenceforward we will speak of them as Athenians and fellow citizens. I see that I shall receive in my turn a perfect and splendid feast of reason. And now, Timaeus, you, I suppose, should speak next, after duly calling upon the gods. All men, Socrates, who have any degree of right feeling, at the beginning of every enterprise, whether small or great, always call upon God. And we, too, who are going to discourse of the nature of the universe, how created, or how existing without creation, if we be not altogether out of our wits, must invoke the aid of gods and goddesses, and pray that our words may be acceptable to them, and consistent with themselves. Let this, then, be our invocation of the gods, to which I add an exhortation of myself to speak in such manner as will be most intelligible to you, and will most accord with my own intent. First, then, in my judgment, we must make a distinction, and ask, what is that which always is and has no becoming? And what is that which is always becoming and never is? That which is apprehended by intelligence and reason is always in the same state, but that which is conceived by opinion with the help of sensation and without reason is always in a process of becoming and perishing and never really is. Now everything that becomes or is created must of necessity be created by some cause, for without a cause nothing can be created. The work of the Creator, whenever he looks to the unchangeable and fashions the form and nature of his work after an unchangeable pattern, must necessarily be made fair and perfect. But when he looks to the created only and uses a created pattern, it is not fair or perfect. Was the heaven, then, or the world, whether called by this or by any other more appropriate name, assuming the name, I am asking a question which has to be asked at the beginning of an inquiry about anything, was the world, I say, always in existence and without beginning, or created and had it a beginning? Created, I reply, being visible and tangible and having a body and therefore sensible, and all sensible things are apprehended by opinion and sense and are in a process of creation, and created. Now that which is created must, as we affirm, of necessity be created by a cause. But the father and maker of all this universe is past finding out, 
and even if we found him, to tell of him to all men would be impossible. And there is still a question to be asked about him. Which of the patterns had the artificer in view when he made the world, the pattern of the unchangeable, or of that which is created? If the world be indeed fair and the artificer good, it is manifest that he must have looked to that which is eternal. But if what cannot be said without blasphemy is true, then to the created pattern. Every one will see that he must have looked to the eternal, for the world is the fairest of creations, and he is the best of causes. And having been created in this way, the world has been framed in the likeness of that which is apprehended by reason and mind, and is unchangeable, and must therefore of necessity, if this is admitted, be a copy of something. Now it is all important that the beginning of everything should be according to nature, and in speaking of the copy and the original, we may assume that words are akin to the matter which they describe. When they relate to the lasting and permanent and intelligible, they ought to be lasting and unalterable, and, as far as their nature allows, irrefutable and immovable, nothing less but when they express only the copy or likeness and not the eternal things themselves, they need only be likely and analogous to the real words. As being is to becoming, so is truth to belief. If, then, Socrates, amid the many opinions about the gods and the generation of the universe, we are not able to give notions which are altogether and in every respect exact and consistent with one another, do not be surprised enough if we adduce probabilities as likely as any others, for we must remember that I who am the speaker, and you who are the judges, are only mortal men, and we ought to accept the tale which is probable, and inquire no further. Excellent, Timaeus, and we will do precisely as you bid us. The prelude is charming and is already accepted by us. May we beg of you to proceed to the strain. End of part one. Part two. Timaeus. Recording by Anna Simon. Let me tell you, then, why the Creator made this world of generation. He was good, and the good can never have any jealousy of anything, and being free from jealousy, he desired that all things should be as like himself as they could be. This is, in the truest sense, the origin of creation and of the world, as we shall do well in believing on the testimony of wise men. God desired that all things should be good and nothing bad, so far as this was attainable. Wherefore also, finding the whole visible sphere not at rest, but moving in an irregular and disorderly fashion, out of disorder he brought order, considering that this was in every way better than the other. Now the deeds of the best could never be or have been other than the fairest, and the Creator, reflecting on the things which are by nature visible, found that no unintelligent creature taken as a whole was fairer than the intelligent taken as a whole, and that intelligence could not be present in anything which was devoid of soul. For which reason, when he was framing the universe, he put intelligence in soul, and soul in body, that he might be the creator of a work which was by nature fairest and best. Wherefore, using the language of probability, we may say that the world became a living creature truly endowed with soul and intelligence by the providence of God. This being supposed, let us proceed to the next stage. In the likeness of what animal did the Creator make the world? It would be an unworthy thing to liken it to any nature which exists as a part only, for nothing can be beautiful which is like any imperfect thing but let us suppose the world to be the very image of that whole of which all other animals both individually and in their tribes are portions. For the original of the universe contains in itself all intelligible beings, just as this world comprehends us and all other visible creatures. For the deity, intending to make this world like the fairest and most perfect of intelligible beings, framed one visible animal comprehending within itself all other animals of a kindred nature. Are we right in saying that there is one world, or that they are many and infinite? There must be one only, if the created copy is to accord with the original. For that which includes all other intelligible creatures, 
cannot have a second or companion. In that case, there would be need of another living being which would include both, and of which they would be parts, and the likeness would be more truly said to resemble not them, but that other which included them. In order, then, that the world might be solitary, like the perfect animal, the Creator made not two worlds, or an infinite number of them, but there is, and ever will be, one only, begotten, and created heaven. Now that which is created is of necessity corporeal, and also visible and tangible, and nothing is visible where there is no fire, or tangible which has no solidity, and nothing is solid without earth. Wherefore also God in the beginning of creation made the body of the universe to consist of fire and earth. But two things cannot be rightly put together without a third. There must be some bond of union between them. And the fairest bond is that which makes the most complete fusion of itself and the things which it combines. And proportion is best adapted to effect such a union. For whenever in any three numbers, whether cube or square, there is a mean, which is to the last term what the first term is to it, and again, when the mean is to the first term, as the last term is to the mean, then the mean becoming first and last, and the first and last both becoming means, they will all of them, of necessity, come to be the same, and having become the same with one another, will be all one. If the universal frame had been created a surface only, and having no depth, a single mean would have sufficed to bind together itself and the other terms, but now, as the world must be solid, and solid bodies are always compacted not by one mean, but by two, God placed water and air in the mean between fire and earth, and made them to have the same proportion so far as was possible. As fire is to air, so is air to water, and as air is to water, so is water to earth. And thus he bound and put together a visible and tangible heaven. And for these reasons, and out of such elements which are in number four, the body of the world was created, and it was harmonized by proportion, and therefore has the spirit of friendship, and having been reconciled to itself, it was indissoluble by the hand of any other than the framer. Now the creation took up the whole of each of the four elements, for the creator compounded the world out of all the fire, and all the water, and all the air, and all the earth, leaving no part of any of them, nor any power of them outside. His intention was, in the first place, that the animal should be as far as possible a perfect whole and of perfect parts. Secondly, that it should be one, leaving no remnants out of which another such world might be created, and also that it should be free from old age and unaffected by disease. Considering that if heat and cold and other powerful forces which unite bodies surround and attack them from without when they are unprepared, they decompose them, and by bringing diseases and old age upon them, make them waste away. For this cause, and on these grounds, he made the world one whole, having every part entire, and being therefore perfect, and not liable to old age and disease. And he gave to the world the figure which was suitable and also natural. Now, to the animal which was to comprehend all animals, that figure was suitable which comprehends within itself all other figures. Wherefore he made the world in the form of a globe, round as from a lath, having its extremes in every direction equidistant from the centre, the most perfect and the most like itself of all figures. For he considered that the like is infinitely fairer than the unlike. This he finished off, making the surface smooth all round for many reasons. In the first place, because the living being had no need of eyes when there was nothing remaining outside him to be seen, nor of ears when there was nothing to be heard, and there was no surrounding atmosphere to be breathed, nor would there have been any use of organs by the help of which he might receive his food or get rid of what he had already digested, since there was nothing which went from him or came into him, for there was nothing beside him. Of design he was created thus, his own waste providing his own food, and all that he did or suffered taking place in and by himself. For the Creator conceived that a being which was self-sufficient would be far more excellent than one which lacked anything, and, as he had no need to take anything or defend himself against anyone, 
the creator did not think it necessary to bestow upon him hands nor had he any need of feet nor of the whole apparatus of walking but the movement suited to his spherical form was assigned to him being of all the seven that which is most appropriate to mind and intelligence and he was made to move in the same manner and on the same spot within his own limits revolving in a circle all the other six motions were taken away from him and he was made not to partake of their deviations and as this circular movement required no feet the universe was created without legs and without feet such was the whole plan of the eternal god about the god that was to be to whom for this reason he gave a body smooth and even having a surface in every direction equidistant from the centre a body entire and perfect and formed out of perfect bodies and in the centre he put the soul which he diffused throughout the body making it also to be the exterior environment of it and he made the universe a circle moving in a circle one and solitary yet by reason of its excellence able to converse with itself and needing no other friendship or acquaintance having these purposes in view he created the world a blessed god now god did not make the soul after the body although we are speaking of them in this order for having brought them together he would never have allowed that the elder should be ruled by the younger but this is a random manner of speaking which we have because somehow we ourselves too are very much under the dominion of chance whereas he made the soul in origin an excellence prior to and older than the body to be the ruler and mistress of whom the body was to be the subject and he made her out of the following elements and on this wise out of the indivisible and unchangeable and also out of that which is divisible and has to do with material bodies he compounded a third and intermediate kind of essence partaking of the nature of the same and of the other and this compound he placed accordingly in a mean between the indivisible and the divisible and material he took the three elements of the same the other and the essence and mingled them into one form compressing by force the reluctant and unsociable nature of the other into the same when he had mingled them with the essence and out of three made one he again divided this whole into as many portions as was fitting each portion being a compound of the same the other and the essence and he proceeded to divide after this manner first of all he took away one part of the whole one and then he separated a second part which was double the first two and then he took away a third part which was half as much again as the second and three times as much as the first three and then he took a fourth part which was twice as much as the second four and a fifth part which was three times the third nine and a sixth part which was eight times the first eight and a seventh part which was twenty-seven times the first twenty-seven after this he filled up the double intervals that is between one two four and eight and the triple that is between one three nine twenty-seven cutting off yet other portions from the mixture and placing them in the intervals so that in each interval there were two kinds of means the one exceeding and exceeded by equal parts of its extremes as for example one four thirds two in which the mean four thirds is one third of one more than one and one third of two less than two the other being that kind of mean which exceeds and is exceeded by an equal number where there were intervals of three halves and of four thirds and of nine eighths made by the connecting terms in the former intervals he filled up all the intervals of four thirds with the interval of nine eighths leaving a fraction over and the interval which this fraction expressed was in the ratio of two hundred and fifty six to two hundred and forty three and thus the whole mixture out of which he cut these portions was all exhausted by him this entire compound he divided lengthways into two parts which he joined to one another at the centre like the letter x and bent them into a circular form connecting them with themselves and each other at the point opposite to their original meeting point and comprehending them in a uniform revolution upon the same axis he made the one the outer and the other the inner circle now the motion of the outer circle he called the motion of the same and the motion of the inner circle the motion of the other or diverse the motion of the same he carried round by the side 
that is, of the rectangular figure supposed to be inscribed in the circle of the same, to the right, and the motion of the diverse diagonally, that is, across the rectangular figure from corner to corner to the left, and he gave dominion to the motion of the same and like, for that he left single and undivided, but the inner motion he divided in six places and made seven unequal circles, having their intervals in ratios of two and three, three of each, and bade the orbits proceed in a direction opposite to one another, and three, sun, mercury, venus, he made to move with equal swiftness, and the remaining four, moon, saturn, mars, jupiter, to move with unequal swiftness to the three and to one another, but in due proportion. Now, when the Creator had framed the soul according to his will, he formed within her the corporeal universe, and brought the two together, and united them centre to centre. The soul, interfused everywhere from the centre to the circumference of heaven, of which also she is the external envelopment, herself turning in herself, began a divine beginning of never ceasing, and rational life enduring throughout all time. The body of heaven is visible, but the soul is invisible, and partakes of reason and harmony, and being made by the best of intellectual and everlasting natures, is the best of things created. And because she is composed of the same, and of the other, and of the essence, these three, and is divided and united in due proportion, and in her revolutions returns upon herself, the soul, when touching anything which has essence, whether dispersed in parts or undivided, is stirred through all her powers to declare the sameness or difference of that thing and some other. And to what individuals are related, and by what affected, and in what way and how and when, both in the world of generation and in the world of immutable being. And when reason, which works with equal truth, whether she be in the circle of the diverse or of the same, in voiceless silence, holding her onward course in the sphere of the self moved. When reason, I say, is hovering around the sensible world, and when the circle of the diverse, also moving, truly imparts the intimations of sense to the whole soul, then arise opinions and beliefs, sure and certain. But when reason is concerned with the rational, and the circle of the same moving smoothly declares it, then intelligence and knowledge are necessarily perfected. And if any one affirms that in which these two are found to be other than the soul, he will say the very opposite of the truth. When the Father and Creator saw the creature which he had made moving and living, the created image of the eternal gods, he rejoiced, and in his joy determined to make the copy still more like the original, and as this was eternal, he sought to make the universe eternal, so far as might be. Now the nature of the ideal being was everlasting, but to bestow this attribute in its fullness upon a creature was impossible. Wherefore he resolved to have a moving image of eternity, and when he set in order the heaven, he made this image eternal, but moving according to number, while eternity itself rests in unity. And this image we call time, for there were no days and nights and months and years before the heaven was created, but when he constructed the heaven, he created them also. They are all parts of time, and the past and future are created species of time, which we unconsciously but wrongly transfer to the eternal essence, for we say that he was, he is, he will be, but the truth is that is alone is properly attributed to him and that was and will be are only to be spoken of becoming in time, for they are motions, but that which is immovably the same cannot become older or younger by time, nor ever did, or has become, or hereafter will be older or younger, nor is subject at all to any of those states which affect moving and sensible things, and of which generation is the cause. These are the forms of time which imitates eternity, and revolves according to a law of number. Moreover, when we say that what has become is become, and what becomes is becoming, and that what will become is about to become, and that the non-existent is non-existent, all these are inaccurate modes of expression. Compare Parmen. But perhaps this whole subject will be more suitably discussed on some other occasion. 
Time, then, and the heaven came into being at the same instant, in order that, having been created together, if ever there was to be a dissolution of them, they might be dissolved together. It was framed after the pattern of the eternal nature that it might resemble this as far as was possible, for the pattern exists from eternity, and the created heaven has been, and is, and will be, in all time. Such was the mind and thought of God in the creation of time. The sun and moon and five other stars, which are called the planets, were created by him in order to distinguish and preserve the numbers of time. And when he had made their several bodies, he placed them in the orbits in which the circle of the other was revolving, in seven orbits, seven stars. First there was the moon in the orbit nearest the earth, and next the sun in the second orbit above the earth. Then came the morning star and the star sacred to Hermes, moving in orbits which have an equal swiftness with the sun, but in an opposite direction. And this is the reason why the sun and Hermes and Lucifer overtake and are overtaken by each other. To enumerate the places which he assigned to the other stars, and to give all the reasons why he assigned them, although a secondary matter, would give more trouble than the primary. These things at some future time, when we are at leisure, may have the consideration which they deserve, but not at present. Now, when all the stars which were necessary to the creation of time had attained a motion suitable to them, and had become living creatures, having bodies fastened by vital chains, and learned their appointed task, moving in the motion of the diverse, which is diagonal, and passes through and is governed by the motion of the same, they revolved, some in a larger and some in a lesser orbit, those which had the lesser orbit revolving faster, and those which had the larger more slowly. Now, by reason of the motion of the same, those which revolved fastest appear to be overtaken by those which moved slower, although they really overtook them, for the motion of the same made them all turn in a spiral, and, because some went one way and some another, that which receded most slowly from the sphere of the same, which was the swiftest, appeared to follow it most nearly. That there might be some visible measure of their relative swiftness and slowness as they proceeded in their eight courses, God lighted a fire, which we now call the sun, in the second from the earth of these orbits, that it might give light to the whole of heaven, and that the animals, as many as nature intended, might participate in number, learning arithmetic from the revolution of the same and the like. Thus then, and for this reason, the night and the day were created, being the period of the one most intelligent revolution. And the month is accomplished when the moon has completed her orbit and overtaken the sun, and the year when the sun has completed his own orbit. Mankind, with hardly an exception, have not remarked the periods of the other stars, and they have no name for them, and do not measure them against one another by the help of number and hence they can scarcely be said to know that their wanderings, being infinite in number and admirable for their variety, make up time. And yet there is no difficulty in seeing that the perfect number of time fulfills the perfect year when all the eight revolutions, having their relative degrees of swiftness, are accomplished together and attain their completion at the same time, measured by the rotation of the same and equally moving. After this manner, and for these reasons, came into being such of the stars as in their heavenly progress received reversals of motion, to the end that the created heaven might imitate the eternal nature, and be as like as possible to the perfect and intelligible animal. Thus far, and until the birth of time, the created universe was made in the likeness of the original, but inasmuch as all animals were not yet comprehended therein, it was still unlike, what remained, the Creator then proceeded to fashion after the nature of the pattern. Now, as in the ideal animal the mind perceives ideas or species of a certain nature and number, he thought that this created animal ought to have a species of a like nature and number. There are four such. One of them is the heavenly race of the gods, another the race of birds whose way is in the air, the third the watery species, and the fourth the pedestrian and land creatures. Of the heavenly and divine he created the greater part out of fire, that they might be the brightest of all things and fairest to behold, and he fashioned them after the likeness of the universe in the figure of a circle, and made them follow the intelligent motion of the supreme, distributing them over the whole circumference of heaven, 
which was to be a true cosmos or glorious world spangled with them all over, and he gave to each of them two movements, the first a movement on the same spot after the same manner, whereby they ever continued to think consistently the same thoughts about the same things, the second a forward movement, in which they are controlled by the revolution of the same and the like, but by the other five motions they were unaffected, in order that each of them might attain the highest perfection, and for this reason the fixed stars were created, to be divine and eternal animals, ever abiding and revolving after the same manner and on the same spot, and the other stars, which reverse their motion and are subject to deviations of this kind, were created in the manner already described. The earth, which is our nurse, clinging, or circling, around the pole which is extended through the universe, he framed to be the guardian and artificer of night and day, first and eldest of gods that are in the interior of heaven. Vain would be the attempt to tell all the figures of them circling as in dance, and their juxtapositions, and the return of them in their evolutions upon themselves, and their approximations, and to say which of these deities in their conjunctions meet, and which of them are in opposition, and in what order they get behind and before one another, and when they are severally eclipsed to our sight, and again reappear, sending terrors and intimations of the future to those who cannot calculate their movements, to attempt to tell of all this without a visible representation of the heavenly system would be labour in vain. Enough on this head. And now let what we have said about the nature of the created and visible gods have an end. End of Part 2 Part 3 Timaeus continues. To know or tell the origin of the other divinities is beyond us, and we must accept the traditions of the men of old time who affirm themselves to be the offspring of the gods, that is what they say, and they must surely have known their own ancestors. How can we doubt the word of the children of the gods, although they give no probable or certain proofs? Still, as they declare that they are speaking of what took place in their own family, we must conform to custom and believe them. In this manner, then, according to them, the genealogy of these gods is to be received and set forth. Oceanus and Tethys were the children of earth and heaven, and from these sprang Phorsis and Kronos and Rhea and all that generation, and from Kronos and Rhea sprang Zeus and Hire and all those who are said to be their brethren, and others who were the children of these. Now, when all of them, both those who visibly appear in their revolutions as well as those other gods who are of a more retiring nature, had come into being, the creator of the universe addressed them in these words, Gods, children of gods, who are my works, and of who I am the artificer and father, my creations are indissoluble, if so I will. All that is bound may be undone, but only an evil being would wish to undo that which is harmonious and happy. Wherefore, since ye are but creatures, ye are not altogether immortal and indissoluble, but ye shall certainly not be dissolved, nor be liable to the fate of death, having in my will a greater and mightier bond than those with which ye were bound at the time of your birth. And now listen to my instructions. Three tribes of mortal beings remain to be created. Without them, the universe will be incomplete, for it will not contain every kind of animal which it ought to contain if it is to be perfect. On the other hand, if they were created by me and received life at my hands, they would be on an equality with the gods. In order, then, that they may be mortal, and that this universe may be truly universal, do ye, according to your natures, betake yourselves to the formation of animals, imitating the power which was shown by me in creating you. The part of them worthy of the name immortal, which is called divine, and is the guiding principle of those who are willing to follow justice and you, of that divine part I will myself sow the seed, and having made a beginning, I will hand the work over to you. And do ye then interweave the mortal with the immortal, and make and beget living creatures, and give them food, and make them to grow, and receive them again in death. Thus he spake, and once more into the cup in which he had previously mingled the soul of the universe, he poured the remains of the elements, and mingled them in much the same manner. They were not, however, pure as before, but diluted to the second and third degree. And having made it, 
he divided the whole mixture into souls equal in number to the stars, and assigned each soul to a star, and having there placed them as in a chariot, he showed them the nature of the universe, and declared to them the laws of destiny, according to which their first birth would be one and the same for all. No one should suffer a disadvantage at his hands, they were to be sown in the instruments of time severally adapted to them, and to come forth the most religious of animals, and as human nature was of two kinds, a superior race would hereafter be called man. Now, when they should be implanted in bodies by necessity, and be always gaining or losing some part of their bodily substance, then in the first place it would be necessary that they should all have in them one and the same faculty of sensation, arising out of irresistible impressions. In the second place they must have love, in which pleasure and pain mingle, also fear and anger, and the feelings which are akin or opposite to them. If they conquered these, they would live righteously, and if they were conquered by them, unrighteously. He who lived well during his appointed time was to return and dwell in his native star, and there he would have a blessed and congenial existence. But if he failed in attaining this, at the second birth he would pass into a woman, and if, when in that state of being, he did not desist from evil, he would continually be changed into some brute who resembled him in the evil nature which he had acquired, and would not cease from his toils and transformations until he followed the revolution of the same and the like within him, and overcame by the help of reason the turbulent and irrational mob of later accretions, made up of fire and air and water and earth, and returned to the form of his first and better state. Having given all these laws to his creatures, that he might be guiltless of future evil in any of them, the Creator sowed some of them in the earth, and some in the moon, and some in the other instruments of time, and when he had sown them, he committed to the younger gods the fashioning of their mortal bodies, and desired them to furnish what was still lacking to the human soul, and having made all the suitable additions to rule over them, and to pilot the mortal animal in the best and wisest manner which they could, and avert from him all but self-inflicted evils. When the Creator had made all these ordinances, he remained in his own accustomed nature, and his children heard and were obedient to their father's word, and receiving from him the immortal principle of a mortal creature, in imitation of their own Creator they borrowed portions of fire and earth and water and air from the world, which were hereafter to be restored. These they took and welded them together, not with the indissoluble chains by which they were themselves bound, but with little pegs too small to be visible, making up out of all the four elements each separate body, and fastening the courses of the immortal soul in a body which was in a state of perpetual influx and efflux. Now these courses, detained as in a vast river, neither overcame nor were overcome, but were hurrying and hurried to and fro, so that the whole animal was moved and progressed, irregularly, however, and irrationally, and anyhow, in all the six directions of motion, wandering backwards and forwards, and right and left, and up and down, and in all the six directions. For great as was the advancing and retiring flood which provided nourishment, the affections produced by external contact caused still greater tumult. When the body of any one met and came into collision with some external fire, or with the solid earth, or the gliding waters, or was caught in the tempest borne on the air, and the motions produced by any of these impulses were carried through the body to the soul. All such motions have consequently received the general name of sensations, which they still retain. And they did in fact at that time create a very great and mighty movement, uniting with the ever-flowing stream in stirring up and violently shaking the courses of the soul, they completely stopped the revolution of the same by their opposing current, and hindered it from predominating and advancing, and they so disturbed the nature of the other, or diverse, that the three double intervals, that is, between one, two, four, eight, and the three triple intervals, that is, between one, three, nine, twenty-seven, together with the mean terms and connecting links which are expressed by the ratios of three to two and four to three, and of nine to eight. These, although they cannot be wholly undone, except by him who united them, were twisted by them in all sorts of ways, and the circles were broken and disordered in every possible manner, 
so that when they moved they were tumbling to pieces, and moved irrationally, at one time in a reverse direction, and then again obliquely, and then upside down, as you might imagine a person who is upside down and has his head leaning upon the ground and his feet up against something in the air, and when he is in such a position both he and the spectator fancy that the right of either is his left and the left right. If, when powerfully experiencing these and similar effects, the revolutions of the soul come in contact with some external thing, either of the class of the same or of the other, they speak of the same or of the other in a manner the very opposite of the truth, and they become false and foolish, and there is no cause or revolution in them which has a guiding or directing power. And if again any sensations enter in violently from without and drag after them the whole vessel of the soul, and the courses of the soul, though they seem to conquer, are really conquered. And by reason of all these affections, the soul, when encased in a mortal body, now as in the beginning, is at first without intelligence. But when the flood of growth and nutriment abates, and the courses of the soul, calming down, go their own way and become steadier as time goes on, then the several circles return to their natural form, and the revolutions are corrected, and they call the same and the other by their right names and make the possessor of them to become a rational being. And if these combine in him with any true nurture or education, he attains the fullness and health of the perfect man, and escapes the worst disease of all. But if he neglects education, he walks lame to the end of his life, and returns imperfect and good for nothing to the world below. This, however, is a later stage. At present we must treat more exactly the subject before us, which involves a preliminary inquiry into the generation of the body and its members, and as to how the soul was created, for what reason and by what providence of the gods, and holding fast to probability we must pursue our way. First, then, the gods, imitating the spherical shape of the universe, enclosed the two divine courses in a spherical body, that namely which we now term the head, being the most divine part of us and the lord of all that is in us. To this, the gods, when they put together the body, gave all the other members to be servants, considering that it partook of every sort of motion. In order, then, that it might not tumble about among the high and deep places of the earth, but might be able to get over the one and out of the other, they provided the body to be its vehicle and means of locomotion, which consequently had length and was furnished with four limbs extended and flexible. These God contrived to be instruments of locomotion with which it might take hold and find support, and so be able to pass through all places, carrying on high the dwelling place of the most sacred and divine part of us. Such was the origin of legs and hands, which for this reason were attached to every man, and the gods, deeming the front part of man to be more honourable and more fit to command than the hinder part, made us to move mostly in a forward direction. Therefore man must needs have his front part unlike and distinguished from the rest of his body. And so, in the vessel of the head, they first of all put a face, in which they inserted organs to minister in all things to the providence of the soul, and they appointed this part, which has authority, to be by nature the part which is in front. And of the organs they first contrived the eyes to give light, and the principle according to which they were inserted was as follows. So much of fire as would not burn but gave a gentle light, they formed into a substance akin to the light of everyday life, and the pure fire which is within us, and related thereto, they made to flow through the eyes in a stream smooth and dense, compressing the whole eye, and especially the centre part, so that it kept out everything of a coarser nature, and allowed to pass only this pure element. When the light of day surrounds the stream of vision, then like falls upon like, and they coalesce, and one body is formed by natural affinity in the line of vision wherever the light that falls from within meets with an external object, and the whole stream of vision, being similarly affected in virtue of similarity, diffuses the motions of what it touches, or what touches it, over the whole body, until they reach the soul, causing that perception which we call sight. But when night comes on, and the external and kindred fire departs, then the stream of vision is cut off, for going forth to an unlike element it is changed and extinguished being no longer of one nature with the surrounding atmosphere which is now deprived of fire, and so the eye no longer sees, 
and we feel disposed to sleep. For when the eyelids, which the gods invented for the preservation of sight, are closed, they keep in the internal fire, and the power of the fire diffuses and equalizes the inward motions. When they are equalized, there is rest, and when the rest is profound, sleep comes over us, scarce disturbed by dreams. But where the greater motions still remain, of whatever nature and in whatever locality, they engender corresponding visions in dreams, which are remembered by us when we are awake and in the external world. And now there is no longer any difficulty in understanding the creation of images in mirrors and all smooth and bright surfaces. For from the communion of the internal and external fires, and again from the union of them and their numerous transformations when they meet in the mirror, all these appearances of necessity arise, when the fire from the face coalesces with the fire from the eye on the bright and smooth surface. And right appears left and left right, because the visual rays come into contact with the rays emitted by the object in a manner contrary to the usual mode of meeting. But the right appears right, and the left left, when the position of one of the two concurring lights is reversed, and this happens when the mirror is concave and its smooth surface repels the right stream of vision to the left side and the left to the right. Or, if the mirror be turned vertically, then the concavity makes the countenance appear to be all upside down, and the lower rays are driven upwards and the upper downwards. All these are to be reckoned among the second and cooperative causes which God, carrying into execution the idea of the best as far as possible, uses as his ministers. They are thought by most men not to be the second, but the prime causes of all things, because they freeze and heat and contract and dilate and the like. But they are not so, for they are incapable of reason or intellect. The only being which can properly have mind is the invisible soul, whereas fire and water and earth and air are all of them visible bodies. The lover of intellect and knowledge ought to explore causes of intelligent nature first of all, and secondly, of those things which, being moved by others, are compelled to move others. And this is what we too must do. Both kinds of causes should be acknowledged by us, but a distinction should be made between those which are endowed with mind, and are the workers of things fair and good, and those which are deprived of intelligence, and always produce chance effects without order or design. Of the second or cooperative causes of sight, which help to give to the eyes the power which they now possess, enough has been said. I will therefore now proceed to speak of the higher use and purpose for which God has given them to us. The sight, in my opinion, is the source of the greatest benefit to us, for had we never seen the stars and the sun and the heaven, none of the words which we have spoken about the universe would ever have been uttered. But now the sight of day and night and the months and the revolutions of the years have created number and have given us a conception of time and the power of inquiring about the nature of the universe, and from this source we have derived philosophy, than which no greater good ever was or will be given by the gods to mortal man. This is the greatest boon of sight, and of the lesser benefits why should I speak? Even the ordinary man, if he were deprived of them, would bewail his loss, but in vain. Thus much let me say, however. God invented and gave us sight to the end that we might behold the courses of intelligence in the heaven, and apply them to the courses of our own intelligence, which are akin to them, the unperturbed to the perturbed, and that we, learning them and partaking of the natural truth of reason, might imitate the absolutely unerring courses of God and regulate our own vagaries. The same may be affirmed of speech and hearing. They have been given by the gods to the same end and for a like reason. For this is the principal end of speech, whereto it most contributes. Moreover, so much of music as is adapted to the sound of the voice and to the sense of hearing is granted to us for the sake of harmony. And harmony, which has motions akin to the revolutions of our souls, is not regarded by the intelligent votary of the muses, as given by them with a view to irrational pleasure, which is deemed to be the purpose of it in our day, but as meant to correct any discord which may have arisen in the courses of the soul, and to be our ally in bringing her into harmony and agreement with herself. And rhythm, too, was given by them for the same reason, on account of the irregular and graceless ways which prevail among mankind generally, and to help us against them. 
End of Part 3 Part 4 Timaeus Continues Thus far in what we have been saying, with small exception, the works of intelligence have been set forth, and now we must place by the side of them, in our discourse, the things which come into being through necessity, for the creation is mixed, being made up of necessity and mind. Mind, the ruling power, persuaded necessity to bring the greater part of the created things to perfection, and thus, and after this manner, in the beginning, when the influence of reason got the better of necessity, the universe was created. But if a person will truly tell of the way in which the work was accomplished, he must include the other influence of the variable cause as well. Wherefore, we must return again and find another suitable beginning, as about the former matters, so also about these to which end we must consider the nature of fire and water and air and earth, such as they were prior to the creation of the heaven, and what was happening to them in this previous state, for no one has as yet explained the manner of their generation, but we speak of fire and the rest of them, whatever they mean, as though men knew their natures, and we maintain them to be the first principles and letters or elements of the whole, when they cannot reasonably be compared by a man of any sense even to syllables or first compounds. And let me say thus much, I will not now speak of the first principle or principles of all things, or by whatever name they are to be called, for this reason, because it is difficult to set forth my opinion according to the method of discussion which we are at present employing. Do not imagine, any more than I can bring myself to imagine, that I should be right in undertaking so great and difficult a task. Remembering what I said at first about probability, I will do my best to give as probable an explanation as any other, or rather more probable, and I will first go back to the beginning and try to speak of each thing and of all. Once more, then, at the commencement of my discourse, I call upon God and beg Him to be our Saviour out of a strange and unwanted inquiry and to bring us to the haven of probability. So now let us begin again. This new beginning of our discussion of the universe requires a fuller division than the former, for then we made two classes, now a third must be revealed. The two sufficed for the former discussion, one which we assumed was a pattern intelligible and always the same, and the second was only the imitation of the pattern, generated and visible. There is also a third kind, which we did not distinguish at the time, conceiving that the two would be enough. But now the argument seems to require that we should set forth in words another kind, which is difficult of explanation and dimly seen. What nature are we to attribute to this new kind of being? We reply that it is the receptacle, and in the manner the nurse of all generation. I have spoken the truth, but I must express myself in clearer language, and this will be an arduous task for many reasons, and in particular because I must first raise questions concerning fire and the other elements, and determine what each of them is. For to say with any probability or certitude which of them should be called water rather than fire, and which should be called any of them rather than all or some one of them, is a difficult matter. How, then, shall we settle this point, and what questions about the elements may be fairly raised? In the first place, we see that what we just now call water, by condensation, I suppose, becomes stone and earth, and this same element, when melted and dispersed, passes into vapour and air. Air again, when inflamed, becomes fire, and again fire, when condensed and extinguished, passes once more into the form of air, and once more air, when collected and condensed, produces cloud and mist, and from these, when still more compressed, comes flowing water, and from water comes earth and stones once more, and thus generation appears to be transmitted from one to the other in a circle. Thus, then, as the several elements never present themselves in the same form, how can any one have the assurance to assert positively that any of them, whatever it may be, is one thing rather than another? No one can, but much the safest plan is to speak of them as follows. Anything which we see to be continually changing, as, for example, fire, we must not call this or that, but rather say that it is of such a nature. Nor let us speak of water as this, but always as such. 
nor must we imply that there is any stability in any of those things which we indicate by the use of the words this and that, supposing ourselves to signify something thereby, for they are too volatile to be detained in any such expressions as this or that, or relative to this, or any other mode of speaking which represents them as permanent. We ought not to apply this to any of them, but rather the word such, which expresses the similar principles circulating in each and all of them. For example, that should be called fire, which is of such a nature always, and so of everything that has generation. That in which the elements severally grow up and appear and decay is alone to be called by the name this or that. But that which is of a certain nature, hot or white, or anything which admits of opposite qualities, and all things that are compounded of them, ought not to be so denominated. Let me make another attempt to explain my meaning more clearly. Suppose a person to make all kinds of figures of gold, and to be always transmuting one form into all the rest. Somebody points to one of them and asks what it is. By far the safest and truest answer is, that is gold, and not to call the triangle or any other figures which are formed in the gold these, as though they had existence, since they are in process of change while he is making the assertion. But if the questioner be willing to take the safe and indefinite expression, such, we should be satisfied and the same argument applies to the universal nature which receives all bodies. That must be always called the same. For while receiving all things, she never departs at all from her own nature, and never in any way or at any time assumes a form like that of any of the things which enter into her. She is the natural recipient of all impressions, and is stunned and informed by them, and appears different from time to time by reason of them but the forms which enter into and go out of her are the likenesses of real existences, modelled after their patterns in a wonderful and inexplicable manner, which we will hereafter investigate. For the present we have only to conceive of three natures. First, that which is in process of generation. Secondly, that in which the generation takes place. And thirdly, that of which the thing generated is a resemblance. And we may liken the receiving principle to a mother, and the soul so a spring to a father, and the intermediate nature to a child, and may remark further that if the model is to take every variety of form, then the matter in which the model is fashioned will not be duly prepared unless it is formless and free from the impress of any of those shapes which it is hereafter to receive from without. For if the matter were like any of the supervening forms, then whenever any opposite or entirely different nature was stamped upon its surface, it would take the impression badly, because it would intrude its own shape. Wherefore, that which is to receive all forms should have no form. As in making perfumes, they first contrive that the liquid substance which is to receive the scent shall be as inodorous as possible, or as those who wish to impress figures on soft substances do not allow any previous impression to remain, but begin by making the surface as even and smooth as possible. In the same way, that which is to receive perpetually and through its whole extent the resemblances of all eternal beings ought to be devoid of any particular form. Wherefore, the mother and receptacle of all created and visible and in any way sensible things is not to be termed earth or air or fire or water or any of their compounds or any of the elements from which these are derived, but is an invisible and formless being which receives all things and in some mysterious way partakes of the intelligible, and is most incomprehensible. In saying this we shall not be far wrong, as far, however, as we can attain to a knowledge of her from the previous considerations, we may truly say that fire is that part of her nature which from time to time is inflamed, and water that which is moistened, and that the mother substance becomes earth and air in so far as she receives the impressions of them. Let us consider this question more precisely. Is there any self-existent fire, and do all those things which we call self-existent exist, or are only those things which we see, or in some way perceive through the bodily organs, truly existent, and nothing whatever besides them? And is all that which we call an intelligible essence nothing at all, and only a name? Here is a question which we must not leave unexamined or undetermined, nor must we affirm too confidently that there can be no decision. 
neither must we interpolate in our present long discourse a digression equally long. But if it is possible to set forth a great principle in a few words, that is just what we want. Thus I state my view. If mind and true opinion are two distinct classes, then I say that there certainly are these self-existent ideas unperceived by sense, and apprehended only by the mind. If, however, as some say, true opinion differs in no respect from mind, then everything that we perceive through the body is to be regarded as most real and certain. But we must affirm them to be distinct, for they have a distinct origin and are of a different nature. The one is implanted in us by instruction, the other by persuasion. The one is always accompanied by true reason, the other is without reason. The one cannot be overcome by persuasion, but the other can. And lastly, every man may be said to share in true opinion, but mind is the attribute of the gods and of very few men. Wherefore also we must acknowledge that there is one kind of being which is always the same, uncreated and indestructible, never receiving anything into itself from without, nor itself going out to any other, but invisible and imperceptible by any sense and of which the contemplation is granted to intelligence only. And there is another nature of the same name with it, and like to it, perceived by sense, created, always in motion, becoming in place and again vanishing out of place, which is apprehended by opinion and sense. And there is a third nature, which is space and is eternal, and admits not of destruction, and provides a home for all created things, and is apprehended without the help of sense, by a kind of spurious reason, and is hardly real, which we, beholding as in a dream, say of all existence that it must of necessity be in some place and occupy a space, but that what is neither in heaven nor in earth has no existence. Of these and other things of the same kind, relating to the true and waking reality of nature, we have only this dreamlike sense, and we are unable to cast off sleep and determine the truth about them. For an image, since the reality after which it is modelled does not belong to it, and it exists ever as the fleeting shadow of some other, must be inferred to be in another, that is, in space, grasping existence in some way or other, or it could not be at all. But true and exact reason, vindicating the nature of true being, maintains that while two things, that is, the image and space, are different, they cannot exist one of them in the other, and so be one and also two at the same time. Thus have I concisely given the result of my thoughts, and my verdict is that being and space and generation, these three, existed in their three ways before the heaven, and that the nurse of generation, moistened by water and inflamed by fire, and receiving the forms of earth and air, and experiencing all the affections which accompany these, presented a strange variety of appearances and being full of powers which were neither similar nor equally balanced, was never in any part in a state of equipoise, but swaying unevenly hither and thither, was shaken by them, and by its motion again shook them, and the elements, when moved, were separated and carried continually, some one way, some another, as, when grain is shaken and winnowed by fans and other instruments used in the threshing of corn, the close and heavy particles are borne away, and settle in one direction, and the loose and light particles in another. In this manner, the four kinds or elements were then shaken by the receiving vessel, which, moving like a winnowing machine, scattered far away from one another the elements most unlike, and forced the most similar elements into close contact. Wherefore, also, the various elements had different places before they were arranged so as to form the universe. At first, they were all without reason and measure, but when the world began to get into order, fire and water and earth and air had only certain faint traces of themselves, and were altogether such as everything might be expected to be in the absence of God. This, I say, was their nature at that time, and God fashioned them by form and number. Let it be consistently maintained by us in all that we say that God made them as far as possible the fairest and best, out of things which were not fair and good. And now I will endeavour to show you the disposition and generation of them by an unaccustomed argument which I am compelled to use, but I believe that you will be able to follow me, for your education has made you familiar with the methods of science. 
In the first place, then, as is evident to all, fire and earth and water and air are bodies, and every sort of body possesses solidity, and every solid must necessarily be contained in planes, and every plane rectilinear figure is composed of triangles, and all triangles are originally of two kinds, both of which are made up of one right and two acute angles. One of them has at either end of the base the half of a divided right angle, having equal sides, while on the other the right angle is divided into unequal parts, having unequal sides. These, then, proceeding by a combination of probability with demonstration, we assume to be the original elements of fire and the other bodies. But the principles which are prior to these God only knows, and he of men who is the friend of God. And next we have to determine what are the four most beautiful bodies which are unlike one another, and of which some are capable of resolution into one another. For having discovered thus much, we shall know the true origin of earth and fire, and of the proportionate and intermediate elements. And then we shall not be willing to allow that there are any distinct kinds of visible bodies fairer than these. Wherefore we must endeavour to construct the four forms of bodies which excel in beauty, and then we shall be able to say that we have sufficiently apprehended their nature. Now, of the two triangles, the isosceles has one form only, the scalene, or unequal-sided, has an infinite number. Of the infinite forms, we must select the most beautiful, if we are to proceed in due order, and any one who can point out a more beautiful form than ours for the construction of these bodies shall carry off the palm, not as an enemy, but as a friend. Now, the one which we maintain to be the most beautiful of all the many triangles, and we need not speak of the others, is that of which the double forms a third triangle, which is equilateral. The reason of this would be long to tell. He who disproves what we are saying, and shows that we are mistaken, may claim a friendly victory. Then let us choose two triangles, out of which fire and the other elements have been constructed. One isosceles, the other having the square of the longer side equal to three times the square of the lesser side. Now is the time to explain what was before obscurely said. There was an error in imagining that all the four elements might be generated by and into one another. This, I say, was an erroneous supposition, for there are generated from the triangles which have selected four kinds, three from the one which has the sides unequal, the fourth alone is framed out of the isosceles triangle. Hence, they cannot all be resolved into one another a great number of small bodies being combined to a few large ones, or the converse. But three of them can be thus resolved and compounded, for they all spring from one, and when the greater bodies are broken up, many small bodies will spring up out of them and take their own proper figures. Or, again, when many small bodies are dissolved into their triangles, if they become one, they will form one large mass of another kind. So much for their passage into one another. I have now to speak of their several kinds, and show out of what combinations of numbers each of them was formed. The first will be the simplest and smallest construction, and its element is that triangle which has its hypotenuse twice the lesser side. When two such triangles are joined at the diagonal, and this is repeated three times, and the triangles rest their diagonals and shorter sides on the same point as a centre, a single equilateral triangle is formed out of six triangles and four equilateral triangles if put together make out of every three plane angles one solid angle, being that which is nearest to the most obtuse of plane angles, and out of the combination of these four angles arises the first solid form which distributes into equal and similar parts the whole circle in which it is inscribed. The second species of solid is formed out of the same triangles, which unite as eight equilateral triangles and form one solid angle out of four plane angles, and out of six such angles the second body is completed. And the third body is made up of 120 triangular elements, forming twelve solid angles, each of them included in five plane equilateral triangles, having altogether twenty bases, each of which is an equilateral triangle. The one element, that is, the triangle which has its hypotenuse twice the lesser side, having generated these figures, generated no more. But the isosceles triangle produced the fourth elementary figure, 
which is compounded of four such triangles, joining their right angles in a centre, and forming one equilateral quadrangle. Six of these, united, form eight solid angles, each of which is made by the combination of three plain right angles. The figure of the body, thus composed, is a cube, having six plain quadrangular equilateral bases. There was yet a fifth combination which God used in the delineation of the universe. Now he who, duly reflecting on all this, inquires whether the worlds are to be regarded as indefinite or definite in number, will be of opinion that the notion of their indefiniteness is characteristic of a sadly indefinite and ignorant mind. He, however, who raises the question whether they are to be truly regarded as one or five, takes up a more reasonable position. Arguing from probabilities, I am of opinion that they are one. Another, regarding the question from another point of view, will be of another mind. But, leaving this inquiry, let us proceed to distribute the elementary forms which have now been created in idea among the four elements. To earth, then, let us assign the cubical form, for earth is the most immovable of the four and the most plastic of all bodies and that which has the most stable basis must of necessity be of such a nature. Now, of the triangles which we assumed at first, that which has two equal sides is by nature more firmly based than that which has unequal sides, and of the compound figures which are formed out of either, the plain equilateral quadrangle has necessarily a more stable base than the equilateral triangle, both in the whole and in the parts. Wherefore, in assigning this figure to earth, we adhere to probability, and to water we assign that one of the remaining forms which is the least movable, and the most movable of them to fire, and to air that which is intermediate. Also we assign the smallest body to fire, and the greatest to water, and the intermediate in size to air, and again the acutest body to fire, and the next in acuteness to air, and the third to water. Of all these elements, that which has the fewest bases must necessarily be the most movable, for it must be the acutest and most penetrating in every way, and also the lightest, as being composed of the smallest number of similar particles. And the second body has similar properties in a second degree, and the third body in the third degree. Let it be agreed, then, both according to strict reason and according to probability, that the pyramid is the solid which is the original element and seed of fire and let us assign the element which was next in the order of generation to air, and the third to water. We must imagine all these to be so small that no single particle of any of the four kinds is seen by us on account of their smallness, but when many of them are collected together their aggregates are seen, and the ratios of their numbers, motions, and other properties everywhere God, as far as necessity allowed or gave consent, has exactly perfected, and harmonized in due proportion. From all that we have just been saying about the elements or kinds, the most probable conclusion is as follows. Earth, when meeting with fire and dissolved by its sharpness, whether the dissolution take place in the fire itself, or perhaps in some mass of air or water, is borne hither and thither, until its parts, meeting together and mutually harmonizing, again become earth, for they can never take any other form. But water, when divided by fire or by air, on reforming, may become one part fire and two parts air, and a single volume of air, divided, becomes two of fire. Again, when a small body of fire is contained in a larger body of air or water or earth, and both are moving, and the fire struggling is overcome and broken up, then two volumes of fire form one volume of air and when air is overcome and cut up into small pieces, two and a half parts of air are condensed into one part of water. Let us consider the matter in another way. When one of the other elements is fastened upon by fire, and is cut by the sharpness of its angles and sides, it coalesces with the fire, and then ceases to be cut by them any longer. For no element which is one and the same with itself can be changed by or change another of the same kind and in the same state. But so long as in the process of transition the weaker is fighting against the stronger, the dissolution continues. Again, when a few small particles, enclosed in many larger ones, 
are in process of decomposition and extinction, they only cease from their tendency to extinction when they consent to pass into the conquering nature and fire becomes air and air water. But if bodies of another kind go and attack them, that is, the small particles, the latter continue to be dissolved until, being completely forced back and dispersed, they make their escape to their own kindred, or else, being overcome and assimilated to the conquering power, they remain where they are and dwell with their victors, and from being many become one. And owing to these affections, all things are changing their place, for by the motion of the receiving vessel, the bulk of each class is distributed into its proper place. But those things which become unlike themselves and like other things are hurried by the shaking into the place of the things to which they grow like. Now, all unmixed and primary bodies are produced by such causes as these. As to the subordinate species which are included in the greater kinds, they are to be attributed to the varieties in the structure of the two original triangles. For either structure did not originally produce the triangle of one size only, but some larger and some smaller, and there are as many sizes as there are species of the four elements. Hence, when they are mingled with themselves and with one another, there is an endless variety of them, which those who would arrive at the probable truth of nature ought duly to consider. End of Part 4